Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is still, as yesterday, Dalibor Topic. I'm still from Germany. I still work for Oracle. Uh, but I'll be talking about something slightly different from yesterday. Uh, yesterday I spoke about preparing your code for JDK 9 in general, and today I'll be talking about modular development with JDK 9, which is, as you can see from this nice picture, again, like yesterday, like JDK 9, under construction. And so that means uh, there is a nice uh, safe harbor statement for you to enjoy while I enjoy a sip of water. And in short, anything here, of course, that I'm going to tell you today may change in the future. Uh, and what does the present look like? So what does the present modularity landscape for, for JDK 9 look like? Um, a bit of background, there is uh, a Java platform module system, JSR, that's the Java specification request 376 with uh, Mark Reinhold as a spec lead. Uh, that JSR uh, has an expert group with a number of people participating from different organizations, and it's targeted for Java SE 9. Java SE 9 JSR will then own, and its expert group will own the modularization of the actual Java SE API, which then itself becomes a sort of API for future releases. The work on the reference implementation of uh, the module system is done within the OpenJDK community in the OpenJDK project Jigsaw, which uh, has been working on uh, the RI through a number of different JDK enhancements, proposals, JEPs, so 200, 201, 220. The first three have all gone into the JDK 9 already, and then the, the latest ones with the actual module system and linker to 16 to 61. Um, there is often a question about how JEPs and and uh, JSRs relate together, there is no one-to-one -one relationship. So you can have a JSR that can have multiple JEPs implementing them, you can have a JSR that has one JEP implementing it, and you can also have JEPs that don't concern themselves with API aspects, and then you can have as many as you want of those. And the one that's overarching is, is the JEP 200, uh, which describes the modular JDK, which has been where a lot of work has been going into in JDK 9 development over the past years, with the goal to define a module st structure for the JDK itself. Since this work has been happening in parallel to the development of a module system for the platform, the work going, uh, on, going on around JEP 200 and the follow-up JEPs has been uh, done with minimal assumptions about what a future module systems to implement the modularization of JDK would look like. And the goal here is to be able to divide the JDK itself into a set of modules that can be combined, combined together in, at both compile time, at runtime, during installation, uh, into different configurations, uh, some of which are obvious, like the whole Java SE platform itself, the JDK, the JRE, as well as the uh, compact profiles defined in the Java SE 8 specification, but also allowing us to take those modules and components and combine them into configurations that are custom which only contain those modules that an application requires and their transitive dependencies, which would be kind of neat. Uh, in order to do that, there, were, uh, there are a few assumptions of what uh, a module system should look like to modularize the JDK. So modules should somehow be able to contain all the stuff that's in the JDK. So the class files, resources, native code, configuration files. They should be nameable, they should have names. Uh, it should be possible to express the dependencies among each other so that we can say that's, that one part of the JDK depends on the JRE, something like that. It should be possible to export the public types in one of the APIs to other uh, modules so that you know, modules can depend on, on different APIs from different uh, modules to depend on. It should be possible to share internal aspects of the JDK implementation among the modules in, within the JDK. And it should be possible to support refactoring and aggregation of modules. And all of this is going to sound a bit strange to start with, but um, bear with me. We'll, we'll get to the module systems in, in a minute. In order to make this work with, with uh, the platform, there are a few design considerations that have been done within the JDK 
modularization effort themselves. First, it was to uh, figure out how to name modules to make a distinction between those modules that are part of the Java SE APIs. So they start with Java dot something, like Java dot base, and then to, dis uh, to distinguish them from all the all other modules that are not part of the Java SE API, but are actually part of the JDK, for example, different JDK tools. Uh, they have module names that start with JDK dot something. And then um, the other constraint in the design was that if a module exports uh, types from a different module in, its, in one of its method signature of exported types, then it should also export those types for consumption of those modules using it. So that when you have an API exporting you know, types from, I don't know, strings, then everybody using that module should be able to get to the same type it's using. And there's a few other principles we've used to modularize JDK itself that are all outlined in the, in the JEP to ensure that when you create an application that uses a modularized JDK and uh, just uses the APIs in orange as a part of the Java SC uh, specification, then it will run on any implementation of Java SC. Um, and then you have in blue the different aspects of, of the JDK modules that are part of the JDK itself. Like, for example, there is an HTTP server and stuff like that. That's a module graph for the JDK from, from a prototype in Project Jigsaw. This is what it looks like today. That's what it looks like when you download the Jigsaw or LXS builds and start, start playing with it. Now, this looks fairly complex. And um, OK, so we have a rather complex machinery. Um, why are we doing this? Why, why, what's, what's the goal of actually getting a module system in the first place? Well, there are two major goals um, outlined in the JSR itself. Um, one is reliable configuration, so being able to specify what an application is architecturally made of, uh, thereby replacing what's uh, currently a rather weak mechanism to, to structure applications to the class path with something that's um, clearer and simpler to analyze and understand allowing us to express dependencies of uh, different uh, components upon each other without having to rely on, on outside mechanisms. The other aspect is strong encapsulation, so allowing uh, components to declare which packages and types exactly, precisely are available for consumption by other uh, libraries or applications using it, and which aren't, which are actually internal. And um, that's very important when you look at uh, software that's being uh, evolving over time, where uh, the ability to be able to uh, determine how internal API changes without breaking your users because they can't access them in the first place is actually quite vital to be able to, to push things forward. Addressing these two goals also provides additional benefits. So firstly, uh, with the modules, we can then scale the platform both down and upwards to suit different configurations required by different applications. We can also improve the platform integrity, uh, particularly with the JDK. We can then encapsulate all those internal APIs that users may be using unwittingly, which expose their applications to some aggression risk as those internal APIs changes. And we can also use uh, modules to improve performance because a module system that uh, provides strong encapsulation and reliable configuration lets us, in some ways, uh, much better reason about which types an application using a module system actually has access to. And so that way, it's possible ahead of time, for example, or during the linking steps, to introduce new optimizations that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And so modules. Um, as defined in Mark Reinhold's State of the Module System document from, from last autumn, um, are a fundamentally new kind of a component in Java. They're a first-class component, uh, and they're actually part of the language as well as you know, the, the class library in runtime. And they are what you really want. Something, you want something to encapsulate all stuff that goes together. So it's a named, self-describing collection of both code and data. And the code is organized by packages, as it usually is in Java. It can declare what other modules it requires to be able to both compile and run. It can also declare which packages it exports, rather than individual types. 
And all this information is consumed by the module system, which uses it to locate the modules. And it also ensures that only the, the types the modules need are actually accessible to them. And if there aren't, it ensures that uh, you will, you'll get notified about it. So the configuration is reliable. It doesn't just break randomly at runtime. To make that happen, uh, both the compiler um, and the virtual machine work together to pre prevent code from accessing types and packages that are not exported and not available. Now, uh, since modules are a new construct of the language, there is a way within the Java language uh, to define modules, to declare them. And um, since they have a name, it's very simple to define a trivial module. You just say module, the module name, and that's it. You got a module. All right, that's easy. But then you typically want to do a bit more of it than, than just define, you know, an M module. We also want to express some kind of dependencies. And for that, modules can use a requires clause to add the names of the modules they depend on. Again, both at compile time and at runtime. So if Kung Fu bar depends on Kung Fu Baz, our module declaration will be module Kung Fu bar requires Kung Fu Baz. And if there is Kung Fu Bad we require, we can just add it there as well. Now, assuming that uh, Kung Fu bar has over time become a bit more complex and we have some internals of Kung Fu bar we want to keep to ourselves, and we have now a public surface, a public API we export to clients of Kung Fu Bar, then we can use an exports clause um, that uh, lets us express in a declaration which packages are available for consumption by modules using Kung Fu Bar and which all the others are not. And in fact, if there is no exports declaration in the module, then no types of that module are available for use by modules depending on it. It's, in a sense, uh, a leaf node of a graph. So where does the source code go if it's, a, if it's Java, uh, if it's Java language construct? Well, of course, it goes into a Java file. Uh, and the source code for declaration is uh, placed in a file called module-info.java, akin to good old package info Java, I guess. It goes into the top of a module source directory. So you would have module info to Java and then your typical package hierarchy, Kung Fu, you know, bar, whatever, with a different Java files, but also with a different native code files, with a different configuration files and so forth. And then that uh, declaration gets compiled by the Java compiler into a class file, because that's what Java compiler does, compiles Java files into class files, which also goes into the top of the output directory. Now, those names of modules, they uh, are unique. They have to be unique. They cannot conflict. If they do, you get an error, either by, from the compiler or at the runtime. And that's why it's recommended to use a similar way to name them as, as used, being used for, for packages, using this reverse name lockup. But it's recommended. You don't have to do that. You can also name your modules, I don't know, Hans or uh, Joe or Jill, if, if that's your thing. You just have to ensure there is nobody else you, you want to depend on who's naming his modules exactly the same way. Otherwise, you know, two Jills can be friends. Um, one thing that's uh, probably different from what most people familiar with other systems expect is that module declarations don't have any version information. So there is no, uh, there is no version string in the module name and there are no constraints upon dependencies of a module uh, based on versions. It's the names that count, the unique names. And that's intentional. It was not a goal to solve that problem in the module system. Now, since modules are a new thing, um, the question becomes, how do you move to them? In particular, on the deployment side, how do you create something that works both in the modular world of JDK 9 and uh, in the pre-modular world of JDK 8? And for that, we have good old jar files, of course. Uh, and in fact, um, jar files are then extended by putting the module info class file into the jar file to provide the metadata from the uh, module descriptor to the module system, if there is one in place in JDK 9, for example. And uh, 
this is just a class from the perspective of JDK 8, so it happily ignores it, right? So the, the VM in 8 doesn't have a module system, it doesn't care about your module info class. So you get a jar file that works both as a module in case of 9, uh, and just works on the ordinary class path in case of 8 without all this module metadata. And that allows you as a maintainer of a library or an application to ship a single jar file, a single artifact that works both on, on, on 9 and later, as well as a regular jar file on the class path across all the other releases. But jar files are somewhat brittle. Um, they don't necessarily have um, a great standardized structure for pulling in all the other information you want to put in them, like native files, like configuration files. In particular, when you're trying to modularize more complex projects like the JDK. And so there is uh, a new format for delivering modules in JDK 9 called JMod um, that takes all this stuff that belongs together into a single module and creates a, this JMod files. Whether this will be standardized um, has been an open question so far. It's uh, basically a new format supported by the tools in JDK 9. It's also different from the JImage format you may have heard about, which is used for the JDK internal runtime images. JImage is definitely not going to be in any form of shape standardized. That's JDK internal. OK, so those module descriptors, uh, those module uh, info class files, being a bit different from your other ways to describe uh, dependency information, you could think about, say, putting this information to JSON files or XML files or, I don't know, into text files in, within jar files. Um, why class files? Well, class files actually have a bunch of advantages. Uh, they both uh, let us um, use the compiler, which has to be you know, involved in the process of enforcing modules um, on the compile side of things, to, um, to compile this information, this metadata, into usable form by the module system. But also they use, let us use a format that's already extensible and available to the JVM from the, from, from the get-go. So you don't have to fire, so the VM doesn't have to fire up an additional you know, parser for an additional format. It can simply read a class file because it knows how to read a class files and read this information from, for example, uh, class file attributes. And in fact, those class file attributes can then be used to also provide additional information, for example, from IDEs um, about uh, modules author, or license, uh, even versions, if you want to. It's documentary information. It doesn't get used by the module system to guide resolution. But using the class file format, we can just have it accompany uh, the module as it gets delivered. And so with, uh, with Java classes and packages, we have a very simple model where we have a single root, um, where we have Java lang object. And that also means that in the modular world, there is something similar. There's got to be a root module that, every, that contains Java lang object. And that one's called Java base. So that module is always present in the runtime. So even if you create a Hello World application and try to link to the smallest module, it will implicitly depend on java.base and it will include that module in the corresponding runtime. Uh, Java base exports all of the core packages, so Java Lang, Java IO, including those packages for the module system itself, which are in Java Lang module. And to give an idea how this, this works, um, let's go through a simple example, where we have an application called Kung Fu App, which depends on uh, Java SQL, because hey, why not? And uh, so our Kung Fu app has a very simple declaration. It uh, requires Kung Fu bar, which you already uh, described, and requires Java SQL. That's the Java SQL module. So when the module system tries to run the app, it will then try to resolve all the dependencies. So it will try to find the modules that fulfill Kung Fu bar, all right? Try to see if Kung Fu bar has dependencies. Try to find those, resolve them as this goes, until all the dependencies um, in the graph are fulfilled. And the result of that is a transitive closure of the graph. Just a second, yeah. And so 
For example, if Java SQL looks like this, where we have SQL requiring logging and XML and exporting SQL APIs and so forth, we end up with a graph that looks a bit like this. We have Conf Web on top, uh, and then it directly uh, requires Conf Bar and, and SQL, which in turn require XML and logging and so on. Bar requires Baz, as we've seen before, and all of them implicitly, that's the light blue line, require Java base, because they all use code that requires Java link object at least. Which leads us to the next concept of readability. So when a module directly depends on a different module, it can access the types in the exported packages of that module. Um, so we can say that it reads the module, or that the, mo that the second module is readable by the first one. That ensures that we can actually have reliable configuration because we can statically express our dependencies and can verify that every dependency is fulfilled by exactly one module. There are no two different modules trying to be comfort uh, buzz at the same time. That there are no cycles in that graph. So we can determine if there are cycles and then accordingly say this configuration doesn't work. And that each module um, has uh, ex at, at most one, <laughs> one module that defines a, a package it needs types from, which eliminates a typical issue with class path where if you have you know, 15 different versions of uh, a logging framework on your class path, the actual classes being found may very much depend on the order they're in. With modules, uh, a type comes from a package which comes from a module, and that's the module you know, that uh, packages types come from. That's it. And so this reliable configuration is then ensured by the module system, both at compile time and at runtime, thanks to readability. And it can also be faster because we don't have to actually look up the whole class path. We know in the module system where, where the packages for each type are and which module they are. And so where do those, um, uh, uh, the modules uh, fulfilling dependencies come from? They come from something called a module path. Um, and so a module path is a sequence of directories which get searched on a host system for artifacts jar files, jmod files, that define suitable module as required by the declarations uh, uh, of, of the modules uh, that are being resolved. And it's a means to delegate modules rather than individual types. So again, those dependencies are from one module to the next. They're not on specific types, which makes it more efficient and, and more safe than using the class path. And if something doesn't work, then the resolution will fail and give an error message. And so the readability, where one module can read another uh, in, in the module graph, and the export declarations in model declarations combined together uh, give us this strong encapsulation where both the compiler and VM can look at the types uh, and determine if those types are actually accessible by a module or not. And if they're not, you get an error message. And this error message um, is similar conceptually to the error messages you would get when you're accessing you know, a private field or a private method. So for example, you get an illegal, illegal access error by the VM, you get an uh, access exception uh, by the reflection APIs. If you try to access a type that is not exported from a module you're depending on. And that also means that public means something slightly different. So even if a type is public within the module, it doesn't mean that everybody gets to use it. It just, if it's not exported, if its package is not exported, it just means it's public within that module. And um, that's where it's accessible. And so in, in the previous graph, uh, if we add the different packages that are being exported, ConfWeb doesn't export any packages. ConfuBar exports alpha and beta. Baz exports Baz. Uh, Java SQL exports you know, the SQL APIs and some other stuff. Logging exports logging and so forth. And Base exports all the, all the basic rest. Now, um, 
there is an interesting problem here. So if we look at the, the SQL module, it requires logging, right? So SQL requires logging. And it even has APIs um, it exports in Java SQL because it exports Java SQL, as we can see here. Um, it has APIs like Java SQL driver, that's an interface, which uh, has a method get parent logger, which returns a logger. Now, logger is not a type from Java SQL, it's a type from the Java logging module. So it's inaccessible to code in the app. So if you look back at the app, let's see. So it's inaccessible to code in the app. And that means we need to, we either need to extend Kung Fu app to also require Java logging, which would be very cumbersome to do each time, because you would really have to know a lot about implementation of Java SQL or we need to do something different. And so there is this concept of implied readability where a module can also grant readability to additional modules upon that are, there is dependencies. So it can say requires public, and that means when, uh, uh, that all the types from Java logging that are exported to Java SQL by, by Java logging are also available to users uh, who depend on Java SQL. And the same goes for types from Java XML. And this lets us um, have something that's actually easier, easier to use in the module system because we don't have to care about uh, the, the implied readability as uh, a correct declaration of Java SQL by looking at different interfaces the module is exporting and which types it's actually exporting from dependent modules and passing them on ensures that uh, Comfo app can actually read the types it needs to read from logging in XML. Okay, so that's all nice. Um, what about services? What about some kind of a loose coupling? So let's say we have um, an SQL driver that connects to a database, like an, a MySQL database. Uh, let's give it a module name like com MySQL JDBC. It's an SQL driver, so it's going to require Java SQL because it's going to implement the Java SQL driver interface. It's probably going to have some logging because what would life be without logging? And it's going to export some API for its users to use to interact with it, like in this case, com MySQL JDBC. And so, for, for the SQL module to make use of a driver, um, we need to both add the driver module somehow to the runtime graph and to resolve the dependencies. Then this needs to happen through a service loader that then uses reflection to, to instantiate it. And so how does this happen? Well, that means the module system needs to be able to find services in their implementation. And that means that modules need to, need to declare what services they provide, which services they require, so that the module system can, max, can, can match them. And this is done through a provides clause. So the module system can say, uh, the module declaration can, can be uh, com, uh, MySQL JDBC provides a Java SQL driver implementation uh, with com MySQL JDBC driver class. And similarly, um, the module system needs to be able to locate um, the users of it. And so the uh, SQL module then declares that it's a user of an implementation of Java SQL driver so that when this is loaded up, the module system can then hook up the correct SQL driver user with the provider of the service, in this case, the MySQL driver. And this lets us both define the configuration of services within modules, giving us some clarity but also gives us the opportunity to do some checking on those declarations at runtime, so, as well as at compile time. So the, um, the module system can check if those types in the services are actually accessible so that you don't get runtime errors because you can't access a type. It can ensure that providers actually implement the service interfaces they're saying they implement. So for example, if uh, 
the Java SQL driver interface has changed over time for some reason or another, and your module declaring it, uh, itself to be an implementation of that service hasn't changed in a compatible way, then the module system can then check this and let you know before you actually start to run application that something is wrong. And that means we can start to catch runtime problems at compile time, which is quite useful. Now, one thing people also like to do a lot is reflection. And of course, when you add a new concept to the programming language and, and to the runtime, you also want to be able to reflect on it. And that at least means being able to inspect uh, which modules have been loaded, have been resolved in the module graph at runtime. So there is this new package called Java Lang module, um, and that's where the different things like modular descriptors reside. And there is a new class, Java Lang reflect module in the Java Lang reflect package, um, which uh, represents a single module during runtime. So it has a bunch of methods to get its name, to get its module descriptor, to get its corresponding class loader, um, and a method to check if it can read a different module, so if you can see the types from a different module, and a method that lets you check if it exports um, a specific package. And accordingly, since we're for classes, we have something like a class loader, there's also a new method in Java Lang class called getModule that lets you get the corresponding module of a class. So that you can at runtime, write your own code that looks up uh, the, the module graph configuration. Now that doesn't, since modules are there, doesn't mean that class loaders suddenly go away. In fact, there are actually very few restrictions in the module system prototype that's been implemented in Jigsaw so far on the relationships that modules and class loaders can have. So class loaders can load types from a single module or from multiple module, or from all of them in our graph if they have to, as long as those modules don't actually, you know, clash. Um, and that means that each class loader loads exactly, you know, one type from, from a specific module. And this is important because in order to migrate applications that may have more baroque or more complex class loader architectures today to a modular world, it's easier to actually modularize them if class loaders can be upgraded to, uh, to, to a modular world without having to be completely changed around and changing their delegation patterns. And one interesting aspect of that is that even though the, the JDK is modular, it still needs to be able to support class path-based execution for all the code that hasn't been modularized yet and that comes you know, with a class path to run on. And so you have on one hand the JDK itself, which no longer uses a class path internally, but actually uses all these modules like java.base, java.sql, and so forth. And then you have your application that says, okay, I have a class path and I have a jar file, I run this. Um, and so how do the types get resolved then? And for the reasons of backwards compatibility, when we're loading types uh, from a class path, each class loader gets its own sort of virtual unnamed module uh, where all the types that are not defined in a module with a name, so they come from a class path, for example, um, get, get assigned to or are considered to be coming from. Uh, the unnamed module has some interesting properties. It can read every other module loaded by that class loader. It exports all, the, all of its packages to every other module loaded by that class loader. And so it's... Um, it means that if you have an existing application that just uses the class path and doesn't care about modules, right, or doesn't care about one just yet, and just uses the standard APIs and doesn't have to mess with JDK internals, doesn't try to use Sun, MISC, uh, don't touch this ever, or something like that that's been removed, then it'll continue to, to work as before without you having to go forth and modularize your application right away, only if you want to get the benefits of reliable configuration, of strong encapsulation, then you, know, you can go forth and start modularizing applications, start defining modules for the app itself, for example, start defining modules for the dependencies it has, and then using that to gradually move your application 
bit by bit from a class path world to a modular world. And some of the nice properties of a system are that um, it allows such migration to happen piece by piece. So you don't have to do everything at once. You can start with one large module covering everything and then gradually chop it up, for example. Or you can start bottom up with it, converting the libraries to modules first and using the class path for the rest through unnamed modules. Now in this um, state of the module system um, document from Mark, there is a whole bunch of other more advanced topics, which I'll just go over very briefly. One aspect uh, that's very interesting when you are um, exporting internals is that you really want to be able to export those internals to uh, consumers you control or you know. So that, um, for example, java.base, being the, the core module, has a lot of internal functionality, like sun reflect or, you know, sun don't touch this ever which is quite useful when you're implementing java.base and may even be useful when you're implementing java.logging. But certainly isn't something you wouldn't want, you would want to expose to any module out there, any application out there. And so there is something called qualified exports where you can use a restricts clause, uh, an exports clause with a two qualifier to say, which packages you export to which named modules. And this is interesting because it puts the control about who, who gets to use those internals into the hands of the module author of the module whose internals are supposed to be used rather than the other way around, right? So you as somebody who is designing a system um, or designing the module can determine who uh, your friends are who get to see your shared internals. Uh, another aspect that comes up is um, that sometimes you need to be able to adjust the module graph at runtime. And that means you need to be able to somehow, uh, for example, if you have a framework that uses factories, which use configuration files to figure out what instantiate in those factories, you sometimes have to make a choice at runtime what, what modules um, uh, need to read which types. And so there is uh, a method within, within the, the module um, class in, in reflection um, called add reads that lets you add additional edges to other modules at runtime so that you can also access the types from those modules within the types you're adding the reads from. And that's also a powerful concept to manipulate the, the module graph at runtime and for example, um, improve uh, the interaction with frameworks in JDK 9. And uh, the last item is actually pretty complex. It's about layers of modules. When you have applications that are hosting other applications, like application servers, then um, you typically want to be able to run multiple applications within such hosted, hosted environments at the same time on the same application server, for example. And that means a requirement that each named module is present only once can become problematic because you may very well have an application that requires um, one instance of um, Apache logging, whereas you have a different application that requires a different instance of it, and you want to run them simultaneously. And you can't because they both have modules trying to provide the same packages. And the solution there is, is our layers, which can be stacked and can be used to, um, to have different service providers and different module versions at runtime in your module graph. And for those of you who want to know or need to know about these kind of things, um, there is actually a lot of material on the, on the Jigsaw pages um, covering those um, those, de uh, those implementation aspects in a lot of detail. I'll show you a few of them in a moment. So if you go to the OpenJDK Jigsaw page in your, let's see, open clip. So if you go to the OpenJDK Jigsaw project page, 
you'll find uh, documents like this state of the module system document that I basically went through here. And you'll also find tutorials and, and other information about, in particular, how to use um, Jigsaw to modularize your own code, um, including you know stuff about layers and, and using the linker tool. If you're interested in the module system itself, the specification of it is being done, as I said, in the JSR 376. There is an expert group for that. Uh, there is a bunch of mailing lists um, that cover the expert group's work. So there is, uh, in particular, for, for most of us, interesting guess is the spec of service mailing list you can subscribe to and uh, read all the traffic from the expert group and also participate in discussions among other observers. Um, keep in mind, though, that expert group members don't have to follow that mailing list. So if you have comments on, on the system itself, please send them to the JPMS spec comments mailing list. That's the one that the expert group is supposed to always take a look at. Um, the current status of the spec effort is, uh, there is an email from the spec lead, Mark Reinhold, to, to, uh, to the expert group list that they're preparing for the, for the early draft review. Um, and as part of that, um, the feedback so far on the module system, there's been a whole lot of feedback, as you can imagine, since last autumn has been collected. Uh, and there's a number of issues for the expert group to consider and uh, consider if they want to address them and if, and if so, how, including you know, suggestions that maybe the module declaration syntax could change. Maybe having optional dependencies could happen and so forth and so forth. So if you have feedback on the module system after reading documents and so forth, make sure to check the, the issues list here to see if your concerns aren't already on the queue. And if they aren't, please do send them to the expert group so they are aware of, of your feedback and can consider it in further deliberations. And so that's the spec side. What about the implementation side of this? So I mentioned that uh, the work on the implementation of the module system, reference implementation is happening in the OpenJDK project Jigsaw. That means it hasn't landed in the JDK 9 mainline yet. Um, in order to, uh, for it to land, there was an email from Alan Bateman to the Jigsaw dev analysts uh, yesterday asking for help testing early access builds of Jigsaw so that we can get you know, more feedback on what's working, what's not working with a prototype, what sort of issues are there to, to address. And so if you're interested in helping out here and, and, and doing a bit of testing of the Jigsaw implementation of the module system with your own code, you can get the builds of Jigsaw at jdk9java.net slash Jigsaw. And of course, um, if you find issues, in particular if you try to modularize your own code uh, and bump into problems, let us know on the jigsaw-dev mailing list. Okay. So that's the list to follow. You can find the builds there. And of course, uh, even if uh, the module system doesn't affect you yet, if it's not something that you think you'll need to use right away, don't forget to prepare your code for JDK 9 because as those of you who've been in my presentation yesterday know, there is a whole bunch of other things happening in JDK 9 beside the module system that you should start thinking about uh, how to benefit or adjust your code to benefit from. With that, here is my other safe harbor statement statement and then i guess we have about five minutes for questions assuming there are any questions i mean module systems are easy no questions right well um yesterday uh on um, on, um you you you're in holler when he was talking about the spring he was Assuming that it's quite possible for a project Jigsaw to be delayed, how do you rate this um, possibility? I don't speculate. <laughs> well, uh, okay, then uh, the, the other question about, um, uh, you had this example uh, when, 
um, one module is exporting uh, uh, to, to in, in, inter internal. Uh, it was like uh, export uh, Java Reflect to Java SQL. Right. So uh, that doesn't it, uh, um, introduces some kind of cycle when a low level module ha has has to know about the other modules. So it. Uh, well, the, the, the goal there is to, to export, you know, to share internals of an implementation. So when you're saying, um, when you have internals like Sun Reflect, right, and you use those internals in different modules across a single project, you know who your consumers are. You know the architecture of your project. So you can name them and you can say, all right, Sun Reflect is only useful to, I don't know, Java U to logging, and that's it. And so it's, it's, uh, it changes a bit the, I guess, the usual relationship where uh, with JARFAS you can basically never be sure that your consumers won't do something they're not supposed to do and won't just go and say, well, you know, it looks like you have uh, org Apache internal in here. I'll just use that. It, it you know, helps me do my job. And if you break it, I'll cry. But, you know, that's what it's going to be. Whereas with the qualified experts, you as the author can actually say, I know my users. I know which users have a qualified need for this internal uh, part of the, the module to be shared to them. And everybody else I know doesn't have a qualified need. And if they do, you know, they'll have to come to me and let me know about it. And so this changes this, this relationship quite a bit and lets you build more reliable systems. That's that's how it works. It doesn't create a cycle in that sense because the cycle will be between modules themselves. And so, um, for example, Java base doesn't depend on any other module. It's in the same sense, you know, the, the basic module, it's at the bottom of everything. Um, so all it does is basically it provides APIs to other modules in the JDK. And some of those it provides to everybody, like Java Lang, you know, Java IO, because everybody needs that. But stuff that's internal to the JDK, that's only useful to JDK itself, that it exports only to those known modules within the JDK that require that functionality, and nobody else. Because of course, some of these, you know, some of these knives are quite sharp, so you really don't want to have them uh, have them used by any other module. Yes, please. Uh, actually, I have two questions. And first is, is it possible so how uh, to plug in module during runtime dynamically? Uh, for example, I'm writing some uh, SQL client, desktop application, and uh, until runtime, I, I uh, do not know which driver I will use. So I uh, might need to plug in module dynamically. Is it possible? You can add reads uh, at runtime, and so at, at Basically, you can write code that traverses the module graph and then adds reads to other modules as necessary. So you can, you can do that. The, the question that, uh, that comes up is, is it possible to do optional modules where you have you know, a certain configurations at compile time and depending on whether a module is there or not at runtime, you do one thing or the other. In the current design, that's not possible. So you can't have optional modules in the current design. But like everything you know, else, the current design can also change as the expert groups go through feedback and deliberations on it. And the other question about versioning. So it is possible some, somehow to have uh, uh, two different versions in the runtime of, of the same module. We are layers, as we said. Uh, Through so layers, yeah. Layers. You will need to have layers for that. Um, the configuration itself is basically static. So layers kind of break that up and, and give you different the possibility to basically have different la module graphs layered on top of each other. Thanks. Good. One more minute. Hello. I have a question about class loaders. Does class loaders are hierarchical or we are graph, graph or trees? How we look at uh, class loaders in Java 9? Uh, I suggest, so in the interest of time, I suggest you you read JEP 260, which has a pretty extensive section on how class loaders work in the modular world, because that's 
a bit of a longer answer. Okay. And since we're below minutes, um, rather than rushing to the next question and referring to commentation, I'll just thank you for your attention um, and ask you again to you know download the, the Jigsaw early access builds, play with them and let us know about issues you find. If you have further questions, don't hesitate to catch me after the presentation. I'll be around here either in the room or at the conference or ask me on Twitter and we can meet and chat. Thank you very much.